Hi guys, I hope my screen is visible to all. And you can hear me. Yes, if you can hear me, please type yes in the chat box. So I'll get to know you all are there. OK, great. Uh, so guys, welcome you all in this webinar on DP 900 as your data fundamental. So it is a full day webinar. From 10 AM to 6 PM. Uh, we will wait for other participants for more 5 to 10 minutes as the participants are joining. So we'll start the webinar in more 5 to 10 minutes. So till the time what you can you all can do is I will be sharing the links for our social media platforms in the chat box. So do follow the links and you can go and check our social media platforms. You can follow our social media platforms to get the updates on the webinars, workshop and certification training which we do. So I will sharing the links in the chat box for you all. So go through that. Thanks for your patience, guys.
Uh, those who have connected just now, please note we'll wait for more four or five minutes as other participants are still joining. I repeat, we'll wait for more five to ten minutes as other participants are still joining the webinar. Till the time, you can do follow our social media platforms. I have shared the links for the same in the chat box, so you can go and get the access for the links in the chat box. Also, if you have any doubt or query, you can use the chat window. And ask these questions or query if you have any. Uh, yes, I will share. We will be sharing the badge for this DP 900 certification. We'll explain you all uh, the badge related steps and how to get your badge ready ahead in the webinar.
Okay, so we'll start now. Hello and welcome you all. Uh, myself, Chaitali. I'm your host for this full day training on DP900 as your data fundamental. I will be there to help you out throughout this training. So you just need to use your chat window uh, to ask the questions or queries so we, we can help you. So first of all, thank you all for joining us today. We'll really appreciate your participation in this training. So moving ahead, talking about uh, today's event. Uh, webinar sponsor Synergetics. So Synergetics is India's kind corporate learning solution company. So you will get a question now like what we do, who we are. So answering to that question, we browse you through the offerings and also give comprehensive advisory services to the clients who wish to modernize the IT framework. Uh, we do educate, advise, implement and manage. Then the solutions which Synergetics offers, as you can see, we have onboarding add-on solution, persona-based onboarding solution, then we have certification solution, then we have certification add-on solution, latest technology training solution and emerging technology training solution. So today's DP900 certification comes under onboarding add-on and certification solution. Then what does Microsoft certification training give? So it will give a complete learning experience. You will get trained build confidence to appear for the exam and get certified that is get recognized. Journey path like how you can go for the advanced certification once you complete the fundamental training. So this is the journey path. Here you can see we do provide advanced paid training at minimum cost. For that, you have to first complete fundamental training and then you can go for advanced training, advanced role base or advanced expert level certification. Then how you can advance yourself? So, so this is the skilling journey of Microsoft. First, you have to complete fundamental certification and you can go for advanced level that is for DP203 certification. Certification benefits, here you can see. Okay, so what benefits uh, you will give to the organize, organization once you complete the certification? So you will get an uh, you will get to a structured learning from unstructured learning. Then you can enhance the brand reputation and give profit to the business. There are three types of scaling journey as you can see on the screen. We have fundamental training, then we have advanced role based training, then the expert level training. As I said, the fundamental certification on which we do provide trainings that are AZ900, that is Azure Fundamentals, then AI900, Azure AI Fundamental, DP900, Azure Data Fundamental, PL900, Power Platform Fundamental, and SC900, Security Compliance and Identity Fundamental. Then you can see advanced role based certification that is associate level. And this we have AZ104, AZ204 that is for developer associate, then AI102, Azure AI engineering associate, DP203, Azure data engineer associate, 
PL100 Power Platform App Maker Associate, uh, PL200, PL300, SC200, and SC300. And in advanced and uh, expert level, we have AZ305 certification, SC100 certification, PL600, and AZ400. So to know more about the certification and trainings which we do, you can connect us. I will share the details with you all in this chat box. Our certification offerings. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, uh, expand your knowledge and skill. Uh, we do provide certification add-ons onboardings and uh, onboarding add-on solutions like short duration modules and more in this offerings moving ahead today's training is organized and handled by atc community that is azure tech community so our atc community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technologies and various emerging technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, open source, uh, IoT, cloud and DevOps. You can follow our communities to get updates on webinar, workshop, on latest and emerging, emerging technology, which we do. We have emerging technology community for all. Then we have Azure Tech Community Pune for Pune Kurs. Emerging Technology Community Surat for Surat Tech. Then Azure Tech Community Nagpur for Nagpur Kurs. So to follow our communities, you just need to install the Meetup app on your device or on your phone. Uh, I will share the links for these communities in the chat box so you can go and follow that. Then you have to follow code of conduct, uh, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note, participants are not allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation while speaker is sharing his or her screen. Uh, we will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel link will be provided to you all in the chat box. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Then speaker for this training is Mansi Shani. She is an MCT Microsoft certified trainer and currently works with Synergetics as training consultant. Then the agenda for this training, you will get to know more about DP900 certification and benefits of it. Also, we will sharing a complimentary learning achievement batch. Uh, so this learning achievement batch uh, includes modules and overview of the learning path related to DP900 certification. Uh, for that, you have to follow certain steps to get this batch redeemed. You have to go on Microsoft Learn Platform. You have to create a account over there, learn profile over there. Once you create a profile, I will be sharing a link with the steps. You have to just go and click on the link and the batch will get redeemed. Also, do follow us on our social media platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, YouTube and Twitter to get the relevant updates on the workshop uh, webinars which we do. That's all from my side. Thanks to all. Over to you, Mansi. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Chaitali. A very good morning to everyone.
just sharing my screen. Um, Chaitali, can you just tell me whether you can see my screen? Uh, yeah, Mansi, it is visible, yes. Okay, great. So, once again, a very good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to this one-day webinar on uh, Azure Data Fundamental Certification, that is DP900. Uh, uh, just a little more introduction to what um, who I am. Okay, so my name is Manasi Shahani, and I work with Synergetics as a trainer consultant for uh, IoT, Python, uh, data analytics, and AI uh, domains. So I am a Microsoft certified trainer, and I have done, I've been working in the data domain for quite some time now, and I have uh, specialized myself in all the certifications uh, regarding the data uh, domain that Microsoft offers. Okay, so I will be conducting this one day training for you all. Okay, so before we get into this uh, uh, training or overview kind of a session, um, just I want to give a brief introduction as to what is GP900 and uh, what are the prerequisites, who should do uh, DP900 and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a fundamental certification or a foundational course, you can say it's for anyone. OK, uh, who does not have a background in um, cloud can do this course, who does not have a background in data can do this course. OK, and we all know like nowadays data is increasing at is just going on increasing in billions. Like you find data in, you know, uh, billions and I mean in it's not in KBs or MBs it is now becoming into GBs, PBs and TBs uh, since the explosion of social media websites like Facebook, Amazon all these websites and applications you know are creating a boost so that so much data is collected uh, within organizations as well your particular organization will be creating so much of information so much of data OK, so we need people to manage it. We need to learn how to manage it. And that's what we will be learning in this course. OK, so it's going to be very fundamental. We will be talking about um, how to manage this data, how to work with this data. OK, it's right from the scratch. OK, so anyone can do this course. OK, it's going to be talking completely about data. OK, now coming to this. DP 900, what is the agenda for this entire webinar? OK, so DP 900 has four modules. Module one, where we'll be. Data and stuff related to data. OK, then we will be moving on to some relational concepts of data, like databases and all of that. Then we will be moving on to understanding how to manage non-relational data, which is making up to in today's time around 90% of it. Okay. Then finally, we will be moving on to the analytics part of data. And you know, data without analytics has no meaning, absolutely no meaning, because once you get the data, what are you going to do with it? You're, you can't just keep it idle, right? You have to make some decisions, some meaningful insights out of it so that it benefits your organization. OK, and you can uh, make. You know, uh, full proof decisions based on the data. OK, so that's what we are going to see. OK, so all of these things that I mentioned here, we will be looking at in terms of services and concepts pertaining to only Microsoft Azure Cloud. OK, so quick. Um, so it's going to be all about the services, tools related to data on Azure. 
on cloud. So that's what basically DP900 is, whereas AZ900 just talks about the fundamentals of cloud. OK, but this particular certification is just going to talk about fundamentals of data on Azure. OK, now coming to the so exam. Sorry, by mistake, I have put AZ900, but this is DP900, guys. Just make a note of this. So uh, these are the four modules and when you once you finish this training, you will like to give the certification exam right in order to get certified on DP 900. So uh, how are how is the certification module wise divided? OK, what is the breakup of uh, the amount or, or percentage of what is going to come of from what module is going to come in the certification. So the first module has around 25 to 30 percent, which is the highest. OK, so you need to focus on the first module itself. Then we have the second module, which is around 20 to 25 percent, which is another important module. Then third is around 50 to 20 percent. OK. And then finally, it's a, uh, the last module is around 20 to 25 percent. So, you know, every so I'm not going to say that, OK, module one is important. Every module in this certification carries almost equal weightage. So doing them thoroughly is very important. And then you can do labs. OK, there are a couple of labs that I will be showing you all how you can do it. I will be telling you all about how you can start your Azure subscription. OK, free trial. OK, you don't have to pay much on one month. You get around free. Uh, all you need is a credit card. OK, so we will see. I will be sharing the link for the same. OK, you all can go and start your free trial. If you don't want to do that, you can uh, go on the Learn website that I will be showing all, and you can activate the Microsoft Learn Sandbox where you can practice your labs, do a few labs that I will be showing you all over here. OK, so now let's get started with Module 1. So before we uh, get into Module 1, guys, I have a couple of questions for you all. How much confident are you all with uh, what is um, resource group in Azure. Do you all understand what is a resource group? What is uh, Azure subscription? What is um, what is the Azure portal? Do you do you all know that? So can you all just quick like quickly tell me your understanding, your confidence of resource groups? Great, I can see three people already know about it. What about the rest? <clears throat> okay, so I see that a lot of people know what a resource group is and. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just do a quick brief. I mean, I'll do a quick overview of a resource group and all because uh, when we use when we go into uh, doing the labs, OK, um, you will need that knowledge. <clears throat> so I hope you all know what is IS, PaaS and SaaS infrastructure as a service. Um, Platform as a service, uh, software as a service. Yes, guys. Do you all have knowledge about that? OK, I can see a lot of people know about that as well. <clears throat> OK, so now I'll just do a quick overview of all these topics. Just a quick brief, guys. Uh, we will not spend much time on it.
Yeah. So infrastructure as a service, uh, the classic example of infrastructure as a service is your virtual machine. Okay. So if a user, a cloud user wants full liberty, okay, of managing the infrastructure, okay, uh, we call that particular service as infrastructure as a service where you manage the virtual machine, you manage the operating system, okay, what kind of an image you want on the operating system, um, okay, like whether it should be Windows or Linux, it's up to you. Okay, you decide what kind of uh, store disk you want. Okay, uh, whether it should be HDD, SSD, you decide the size, you decide the image on the disk. Okay, so if you want full control, okay, of the infrastructure uh, with minimum responsibility uh, to the cloud service provider, whether it's Azure, AWS, or GCP, okay, that service is called IAS. OK, so what does the cloud service provider do in that case? He just manages the data center requirements, the physical requirements at a data center. So do you all know what is a data center, guys? Just a quick uh, brief on that. I mean, just put it in the chat box. Do you all know what is a data center? How? Um, great. Okay, so they so data center basically is like um uh, you can call it like a, a building full of servers, okay, where your applications are deployed. Okay, you need servers, okay, uh, in order to run your applications. So that's what um yes, absolutely right. So so where servers are hosted, okay. So whatever uh, requirement in terms of uh, uh, physical uh, needs are there in terms of your storage or network or um, um, uh, all of these things, okay? Uh, Microsoft or any of the cloud service providers, AWS, GCP, or Azure will take care. But on those servers, if you want to have a full infrastructure flexibility, that's what uh, the IAS does, okay? Then we have platform as a service. OK, so platform as a service will give you very little flexibility. Let's say you don't want to manage the infrastructure at all. You want the cloud service provider to take care of that. OK, um, you just want to focus on the application and on the data that you are providing. OK, just build the application. OK, you just want to take care of that. You don't want to worry about what uh, environment is being used in your physical uh, on the physical data center okay you uh, that service is called as platform as a service okay so majority of the services that you will see today okay whether it's a database it's a storage account it's a cosmos db no relational database or any of the analytical tools or services on azure that you are going to see is um, going to be platform as a service oriented OK, so that's what basically platform as a service is. OK, it gives you the least flex. I mean, uh, least flexibility. Let's put it like that. And you just manage the application. Uh, then we have a software as a service. The classic example that I love to give for software as a service is Office 365. I'm pretty sure everyone uses Office 365. OK, and uh, they uh, you all use the applications in it, correct? So you don't even have to worry about creating the application, OK? So this is what is basically the three uh, services that are there. So our main focus today is going to be more on, more or less all our services are going to be pass oriented, OK? So guys, you all also told me about uh, resource group. So just a quick uh, check on that. So Azure has 60 plus regions across the globe. OK, you can you in order to use the data center, you have to uh, select the region that you are going to deploy your services. OK, so you can do it on these 60 plus regions that are there. OK, and 
then if you have to create uh, any of these resources, you need to put it inside a, a resource group. So what is a resource group? It's like a container, okay, where you will have to put all your applications, whether it's a VM, whether it's a database or storage account, okay, you need to put it into a logical uh, location, into a logical container, and that's what a resource group is. Okay, so you can have multiple resources, that is VMs, storage account, database into one container. Okay, so that's what is about a resource group. Okay, so now moving forward to our uh, DP900, we will be now moving on to the module one. So what does module one cover basically? So guys, uh, let me just give you a, 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 a little understanding. We are not going to go in depth of uh, lots of concepts. This particular training does not involve that. Okay, DP900 does not involve that. Uh, it's just going to be more or less of an overview. Okay, of what are the services related to data on Azure. Okay, so we will not be going in much depth of the concept, just a uh, overview of it. Okay, so in module one, uh, we have divided this into two lessons. Uh, first is where we'll be looking at core data concepts. Okay, um, then finally, we'll be looking at certain data rules. Like I said, data is increasing tremendously nowadays, exponentially it is increasing. OK, so we need to uh, manage that data. And in order to manage that data, we will need people, right? And one person cannot manage huge data. Think of it, you know, uh, if he has to uh, do all the tasks related to data, right? It's impossible. OK, so we will be understanding the roles and services on uh, of data. So before we go into uh, uh, now, let's start with lesson one. OK, so can I have a brief understanding from you all? Like what is um, data? What according to your means data? What is your understanding of data? Yes, guys, you all can put it in the chat. Yes, absolutely right, guys. On point. Okay. So data is nothing but information. It's something that gives you a knowledge of what it is. Okay. Of basically, I will call it information or facts. Okay. Like we as people, we ourselves are data. So what is that? Our name, uh, our age, our email ID, our uh, Passwords are um, height, are when number of things are nothing but data. Okay, so data is information, facts. Okay, about a person, about observations, about uh, uh, any anything. OK, right from your uh, social media platform, how much you're using the social media platform, how much you're in there also, how much Instagram you're using, how much Facebook you're using. Now there is a new application threads. How much of that you have used? OK, how many how many ma mails you send on a day? How many mails you receive on a day? Well, this all information or even real time data, right? Uh, stock market or um, data coming from iot devices your smart watches your smart homes all of this is nothing but information right 
in form of a data. So data is information. Okay, it is entities. You can have entities or attributes inside it. Okay, and it tells you about a particular organization, about a person. Okay, right from the phone number, name, address, all these stuff are nothing but data. Now, what are the different types of data? What is your understanding of data? What are the different types of data available in the market? Yes, guys, you all can put it in the chat. Yes, structured, unstructured data, absolutely right. Okay, so data has three types, structured data, unstructured data, and semi-structured data. Okay, so now what is a structured data? Any any example, guys, on structured data? Can you all give me some example? Or what do you mean by structured data? Yes, absolutely right, guys. So a structured data, as the name says, there is going to be some structure. Okay, it's going to be adhering to a fixed schema. Okay, it's going to be in the form of rows and tables. Okay, or attributes and row records. I'm sorry. Okay, so it is something that we the what is the type of the attribute, what kind of uh, data type it is holding. All these information we know, okay, because it has a certain structure to it, okay, it is uh, something that um, we decide we can uh, create in terms, okay, we can also give it a schema, okay. So a structured data is something that will, has a fixed schema, okay, it has it is tables containing of columns and rows, okay? And in order to uh, manage a huge data, okay, we can create relations, we can separate those tables, right? We can create smaller tables, create multiple tables out of that, okay? For example, like we, in an organization, we have HR department, Right. So HR department, what are they going to hold? They're going to hold the employee records and the departments they have. Right. So what is the employee record holding? It is holding the information of the employee, the name, employee number, the phone number of the employee, email address of the employee. Apart from that, it's going to hold the department number. Which department is he working or she is working in? Right. Like whether it's sales department, is it is it the marketing department, is it the uh, admin department, etc. Right. So, what what is the employee record holding? All these information. But then after that, we can't put all the the department information as well along with the employees. Right. So we will create a separate department table and we will create a relation between the two so can you tell me what determines like what is the link between like what do we need in order to establish a relation between two tables what is it that we need how do i determine a relation between absolutely right guys absolutely on point so a relational data okay or tables require something called as a primary key and a foreign key so based on that we can determine the relation how they are related okay which is the foreign key what is the primary key okay and this is what a structured data is basically made up of then we have semi-structured data. So semi-structured data is kind of um, 
Chaitali, am I audible? Guys, am yeah, I audible to you? Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, the ones who are not cannot hear me, just check your internet connection, guys. Okay, so coming to semi-structured data, uh, semi-structured data which has a, a flexible schema, I will not say not have a schema, but it is something that has a structure to it somewhat. Okay, it is like a variation between uh, having a, a, a structure and not a structure. Okay, so the classic example of a semi-structured data is your JSON format. Okay. Okay, so a semi structured data, like you can have your, uh, it's a classic example of like a key value pair, okay, like um, where you have the name, okay, of a person, okay, and you are kind of, then there is fields associated to it, like if you go to a library, okay, like, uh, uh, you um, you want to find out the books of a particular author, okay? So how can they be stored, okay? So what is the key? The key is nothing but the author's name. And then the values that come are of the books that the author has written. So somewhat like that, okay? So there's no structure to it. It's not that we have to store it in a table, okay? You can have flexibility if you want, okay? Like how uh, at times, you know, your metadata, data about data. Right, that is what is called as metadata is stored in the form of a yes, absolutely right. Example, if you all are very familiar with Python, okay, um, you have, I might have heard of dictionaries. So, dictionary is nothing but a classic example of a structured data, okay. So, a structured sorry, semi structured data, okay. So, it has a instance and values associated to that instance. So, it is not stored in the form of tables okay it has it is stored in the form of in curly braces as you can see on the screen okay so the classic example here is your javascript object notation okay where we where uh, you can uh, you uh, you can store it okay this is one form of data okay uh, of for semi structured then finally you have is the unstructured the most commonly used uh, the most commonly used data format nowadays okay because we all use otts we all use social media okay lots of people upload their audios videos images right so th that particular thing does not have schema it does not have any um um structure to it it is like either binary format, right? So we need to, um, there is no structure to it. So in order to have, we need some different ways in order to sco store that data, right? So uh, uh, one other type of data is unstructured data. So in this training, we will be seeing what are the different ways, how can you store these types of data Okay, on Azure, okay, using the services of Azure. Okay. Now, how is data stored? Okay, so um, data basically now, like I told you, is increasing exponentially. Okay, and in order to store this particular data, we need to have some way, okay, uh, in, in which we can store it. And we all know that. Uh, the data can be structured, it can be unstructured, or it can be semi-structured, right? So in order to store these types of data, there are two, two ways in which we can do. One is the file, and the other is the database. So can you tell me for what type of data will I use the database? For what, like, what type of data will I store uh, on the database? Relational. Yes. 
Yes, guys. Yes, absolutely right. We will be storing structured data on a database. Okay, so like if let's say in you are a uh, uh, you you have a store, okay, and uh, you have uh, multiple customers coming in, okay. Um, you can um, you want to store the information of the products that you have, how many stores that you have, how many customers that you have. So, is it uh, logical to? Um, uh, okay, somebody is really asking. Uh, See, see uh, the ones who have logged in, uh, guys, we have kept you all on mute. So you don't have the chance to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, you, you cannot unmute yourself and start talking. If you want to ask questions, please put it in the chat box. Okay. Uh, nobody can mute themselves. Only me, Chaitali, can mute. Uh, uh, only Chaitali can uh, mute, unmute and talk to me or to everyone. Okay. So apart from that, since you all are participants, you don't have the rights to um, mute yourself. So a request to all of you, OK, please do not ask questions that can I uh, unmute and all of that. Please, uh, you cannot unmute yourself and ask questions directly. So if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. Uh, if you have any technical questions, I will uh, answer them once I have finished my uh, once I finished one module. OK, if you have no technical questions, you have Chaitali over here who will take care. OK, uh, like about our uh, about synergetics, about the course achievement batch and all of that. OK, and if you can't hear me, um, put it in. Uh, uh, just put it in the chat box, but I think a lot of people can hear me. So just check your Internet connection, guys. OK, uh, the problem can be from your side. And if my audio is not. Uh, you can't hear me. Chaitali will let me know, okay, uh, that you are unable to hear me. Okay, so just a humble request, guys. Okay, so uh, if I have to store structured data, I will go for a database format, okay, but what if I want to store? Uh, data that does not have structure, let's say semi structured data or unstructured data. So, for that, I will use the file format. Okay. So, a file is where how we all are very much familiar with the file, right? We all store data on our local systems, and that uh, the way we store, we don't store data on databases, right? You don't store. Um, OK, um, we don't store data every day on a database, correct? What we we use, we use is the files, right? So we create folders, we create uh, we create files, we store it in those folders, we create it on a disk, right? Um, all of that we do. OK, so similarly, if I want to store data in files, OK, I can do that. It is. One of the ways in which I can store data. So let's say you want to store your um, unstructured data. You would normally go for a file system. OK, so a file. Is something that. Uh, gives you the ability to store data. OK, you can store it on your disk, on USB file, on, on your uh, uh, pen drives, okay, or something that is of removable type, a hard disk as well, okay. So I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with this, okay. And in order to store these files, there are different formats, okay. Uh, can you, uh, you all can see on the screen also, like we, you all every day work with probably word file or text file or with comma separated files, right? Or you all. You work with images, you might work with audio, video files, right? So what are these? Those are nothing but file extensions, right? We call the type or the format of the file, okay? So 
that's what basically file is basically made of. OK, so you can store it on the file. OK, you can um, use uh, any you can store any file. OK, um, but when you are storing a file, there are certain factors that you need to keep in mind. OK, like the very first thing is the type of the data. OK, or uh, what type of data you can't store, like I said, structured data or relational data. You cannot store it in a file, right? But if uh, it's a semi structured data, it's a unstructured data with any of the extensions like text file, delimited file, text or uh, it's a JSON file or it's an audio file with or it's an image file with .jp or JPEG format, PNG format. OK, all these things you can store. So you need to know what is the type of the data. OK, in order to uh, store. OK, you can't store tables in a file, right? And then if what what operations or applications you want that particular service to do? OK, whether you want to read the file, write on it, you don't want people to, you know, uh, you know, when we work with Word, you get if somebody has shared the file with you, OK, you get an option like whether to enable editing or not. OK, it's something that people will uh, can configure. We can decide who should be able to write on the file and who should be able to only read the file. OK, so these are things you can also uh, configure. You if you want, you can give access to people, not give access to people. OK, so these are the things you can consider while storing a file. And then finally, uh, it should be in the form so that humans can read. OK, what if I give you a file of just zeros and ones? Are you going to be able to understand that? No, right? Who will be able to understand only your computer, but not you? Now imagine if I'm uh, working on a word file, OK, and on that I say I'm just writing zeros and ones and I'm sending that file to you. Are you going to understand like for and it is what what ASCII value it is taking or what of zeros and ones it is con converting? No, you're not going to sit and convert and you know it's not like a Morse code that you're working with or you have to encrypt the data. Right? It should be something that is readable to the humans, right? So these are the few considerations or factors that you should keep in mind when you are using file to be stored. OK, what kind of a data you are using? What kind of a format you are using? OK, like I said, you cannot store um, structured data in a file. OK, because uh, there is no relationship. There can be no relationship between files, right? So that's one thing. And then what accessibility you want to give to that person? And then finally, what kind and it should be of course in a form so that humans can read okay making it efficient for processing and analyzing okay now we will be seeing what are the types of files that we have okay the first thing that you can use is a delimited text the most commonly used uh, delimited text or format is the comma separated values, the CSV files. Lots of people use it. OK, it is something that is spaced. Uh, the values or the attributes are spaced by a comma. OK, that is a comma uh, separating the values. OK, apart from that, we have multiple uh, delimited text. That is the tab separated. That is using a tab. You can separate two values or a normal space separated any space you can give any uh, value you can give in order to sorry separate these two values in that file okay so it's a good way of storing structured data in in a file format if you want to store okay but they will not have any uh, relation OK, uh, it's a good way to have an access. Like you can store it in uh, uh, structured data. And lots of people use CSV files, OK, uh, like um, for analyzing or on Excel. Also, people can use the CSV file, OK? Then we have is the JavaScript object notation. That is your semi-structured kind of flexible schema where you have, 
okay where everything uh, has a data entity and to that data entity you have multiple attributes like let's say a person like me manasi okay i can have my age i can have my email id i can have my phone number as the attributes which are linking me or the author like i gave you the example of an author i want to find out what books or what kind or the books that person that author has written so the name is the key is the is the main object and her books or other values or the attribute so each attribute might have an object okay so it can have a collection of objects so it can have like if you are familiar with python dictionaries okay so a dictionary can have one attribute one object linking to multiple attributes or you can have one at one object linking to multiple objects and then further linking to multiple attributes so like a nested or a hierarchy you can have inside that okay so it's a good flexible option okay it can be both structured and semi structured okay so you can see here an example okay of json document containing collection of customers okay so each customer has minimum three attributes like first name last name contact and contact can have again further more attributes okay like email id phone number okay or uh, etc okay so this is what is a json document okay it can be in, uh, it has to be in curly braces okay uh, in order to keep this uh, if you want to store it in this format then we have is the xml which is the extended markup language nowadays nobody uses this format it was a very popular format in i think the 19 i think around 1999 and 2000s okay it was very popular that time and it was largely used um uh that time but i think json has overtaken this okay i didn't know aadhar still uses it but in now in organizations not many people uh, use uh, uh, xml format okay and xml format if you see is used in terms of like this you need uh, these greater than less than signs and between that you mention your tags you mention what value you want to put like name your first name last name whatever okay and you just close it okay okay Still, people are using it seems XML. That's amazing. But okay, so this is one way you can use. Uh, one of the ways. So this is also like a semi-structured uh, data that you are there. Okay, because it has a schema still to it. Okay, and there is a way to access it. Then you have is the blob. the most commonly used storage i think nowadays in terms if you want to store audio video you want to um, uh, you know um, work around with objects that are binary i mean they are binary and large okay so that means so when you audio and video files or images they are not stored in this format they are stored as zeros and ones or pixels that we call right so you know so those objects are tend to be large in size so hence the name binary large objects okay and this is uh, mostly we you mostly social media platforms or um, in digital marketing space mostly this is used right so um the one so binary large object is one of the ways in which we can store the store our data okay our, our audio video files we store and this data is basically unstructured okay it is in the format of zeros and ones so obviously it's not going to be readable at all to everyone zeros and ones nobody can read okay uh, this is the uh, or pixels you can't read correct so it has to be stored in some format right uh, the format is the blob storage okay then we have some more optimized formats which uh, are used okay like avro it is it was created by apache um and it is like a row based format 
okay uh, so each row or record contains like a header there's a header to it okay and it is stored then later is stored in the form of um, then it has some structure like probably json or something it will be using okay then there is um, orc orc meaning um, optimize you can read it draw a column in a okay so this is something that organizes data into columns rather than rows okay uh, but it is um, something that is It is used for big data analytics and it was developed by Horton Works, I think, the ones who are primarily into uh, uh, big data, like are familiar with Apache Hive. I don't know if you all are, okay, or HD Insights also, if you know, okay, for fast data processing, summarization, querying of large data, okay, this is a popular format that is used, okay, and this gives you uh, a lot of optimized output okay like or uh, very fast reads writes if you want to do so orc is used for that so orc is con consists of something called as stripes okay s-t-r-i-p-s stripes and each stripe okay holds data okay for it can be column or set of columns okay that it can have okay and in order to access those stripes, you have indexes or pointers that we call so that you can access the data inside the uh, stripes. OK. Then the another uh, columnar format is the paraquet. A lot of people also use paraquet, I think. And it was like also uh, it was developed by uh, Cloud Era and Twitter. OK. Uh, I think you should be able to compare stripes so I actually um it's too uh you know uh, you should be able to so this is also another thing in which you can store your data so data ha this also has raw columns and rows but it is stored you know it is more used for metadata purposes okay like every e for the, in order to store the data, you put it in column, but they are then grouped. Okay. Uh, you should be able to, I doubt that actually, if you can convert it, you can. There are different ways in which you can convert a CSV file to a, a paraquet, and there is a tool for that to do. You can do it to other formats. That's totally possible. Like if you want to make CSV to JSON or you want to convert XML to JSON or to CSV, you can definitely do that. There are ways in which you can do it. Okay. So these are some of the optimized formats. Okay. So with this, uh, these are the different types of file formats that are available. Okay. And now coming to database. So guys, you already know what is a database, what it is used for. We will not be spending much time on it. Can I list a couple of examples of, um, you know, databases that are used? Like some examples of databases that you use. Okay, so what are the types of databases, guys? Yeah, it's not actually data warehouse, but yeah, relational, absolutely right. SQL, no SQL, yes, absolutely right. So a database is some is a centralized system where you have uh, data stored um, not as how files are stored, but in a more uh, structured manner. Okay, in terms of a table, 
Okay, and that table consists of row or all these formats that you just saw. You can just put it into uh, a database. Okay, so so relational databases basically are used for structured, and then unstructured data is used with no SQL. Okay, so these are the types. Uh, so if you want to query these databases, you use something called as SQL, that is structured query language. And, or if you want to query non-relational databases, you use not only SQL, that is no SQL. Okay, and you can get information from these databases. So a relational database commonly used. Okay, we all know what it is used for. I'm pretty sure and people might be using it as well. OK. So relations are created OK, between tables like I gave you an example of the employee and the department or you can say if you have a store, OK, you want to uh, 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 save uh, your sales data, your customer information, your product information. OK, so what you do, you put them into small, small tables and you create a relation between them. And in order to create relation, you um, have a concept of primary keys, okay, which links every table to itself, okay, like uh, which is whose property, or oh, that is primary keys property is to be unique and not null. Of course, you can't have a value that is uh, zero, right? Uh, if you have to create a relation between them. So it has there has to be some unique identity in order to um, identify each and every table. Like if you go to um, if you have a you're in an if you go to a school, you know, you have to create a student database. OK, so in a student database, uh, you can't have like a phone number or the first name or the email ID becoming the primary key. Right? Probably a student does not have a phone. Probably the student does not have an email ID. Probably there are two, two, two students who have the same name. Do you think we will be able to identify that student? No, right? What you, you need to have something that is unique in nature. Right? And that you that, uh, that uh, and that uniqueness comes through the roll number. So so we are pretty sure everyone has gone has been to a college, right? And in that college, you get a roll number. So what is that roll number? That roll number becomes your primary key. It's something that I can identify. Okay, this is this person. This is Chaitali. This is this is me. This is anyone. Okay, so. If person loses the ID card, how to how that person gets it back? It's through the roll number, right? And in that roll number, which department he is working in, which what is the name of that student? All that information is linked or related. OK, so this is what is a relational database. OK, examples you have all told me is Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. You have MySQL, Postgre, MariaDB. All these uh, databases are nothing but relational databases. Then we have is the non-relational databases which store the unstructured data, which does not have any relation basically. OK, they are just stored in some format. So you can use the JS. There is uh, there are four types to this non-relational database. First is the key value. OK, uh, the classic example again is the JSON. OK, you can store JSON. OK, if you want to store JSON format, you can do it. Then you have is the column, column and uh, column family. And the classic example is Cassandra database. OK, if you want to use that. Then you have is the graphs. OK, that is um, in graphs. There are some concepts of nodes. OK, there's a node and then every node is again related in the form of a graph. So you can see it over here. Um, in this example, so you can see like me, I am um, my name. Then there is a uh, you. What is a value? Uh, 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 there can be another node for me. OK, like or employee name, house, and all of those informations, you can have it 
store it in the form of a uh, graph and then you can establish relation between those two nodes okay then you can have it in the form of document and the classic example for document is the mongodb okay uh, where you can again store documents okay but these are not json documents unlike your json documents okay and these can also be queried okay the uh, language that we use is the no sql language it does not mean no sql it means not only structured query language so you cannot just use sql you can there is a variation to that language okay so this is one way of storing data then we have is the transactional workloads now what are transactional workloads is where uh, your classic example is your net banking transfer uh, net banking that you do right yeah with your asset properties okay so acid is atomicity consistency isolation and durability so acid meaning um if it the transaction is either a success or a failure okay so let's say um like you are doing a, a net banking right so in that what do would you do normally you would you would uh, let's say i owe some money to chaitali okay so i want to do a transfer i want to transfer let's say 5000 to her okay and i went and i, I went to my own uh, web this thing okay i kind of uh, entered all my details got into my net banking okay and then i see that i have entered all the details but my transaction is um not successful okay or it can either succeed or it for some reasons it did not succeed let's say there was in poor internet connection and something like that okay so it was either it was not a success so that's what basically means there is no atomicity to it. Okay. So atomicity tells you whether your transaction is either success or um, non-successful. Okay. It's a success or a failure. Then we have is consistency. So consist consistency meaning now let's say I owe Chaitali uh, uh, 5,000. Okay. So and my bank account has... 10,000 rupees in my bank balance is let's say 10,000 rupees. So now if I have to give Chaitali 5,000, okay, so my initial amount is 10,000. Now how much do I have to deduct? 5,000, right? And Chaitali should get those 5,000. So consistency states that the sum of transactions before it starts and after it is after the transaction completes should be the same that means if i have 10000 okay earlier okay so i know i'm just giving an example guys okay or to explain like what it is okay so my earlier this thing is 10000 and how much am i and let's say chaitali has some uh, five thousand in her account okay so my ten thousand is going and hers is what five thousand so it's fifteen thousand before the transaction ends okay but after the transaction i have now what five thousand and chaitali should get how much ten thousand okay so you can see the sum was fifteen thousand before and the sum is fifteen thousand even after the transaction so this is what is basically consistency Okay, then isolation, meaning when I'm doing transactions, okay, like I'm just, first of all, I'm just reading the data from my account and then so and so forth, okay. So these transactions should not be able to interfere between each other. Only one, one transaction has completed, then only the next transaction should go on and then the next. So this is what isolation is basically. And durability means, before I do any uh, 
changes okay or the number of changes i do okay in my database okay it should remain permanent okay you should not be able to change that or if that change has occurred it should be done before you commit any transaction it shouldn't be that my 10000 are, are uh, i have done the transaction of 10 i have done the transaction of 5000 and still my money that is being showing is 10000 it shouldn't be that. So before I do any other transaction, okay, my bank balance should reflect the previous transaction. And that is exactly, it's called as the OLTP, okay, online transactional pro, uh, processing, okay. And it should consist all these properties. Then we have is the OLAP, okay. All your analytical workloads, Okay, uh, like re, re, like if you want to read real time data, which is in vast volumes, there's a lot of speed involved. Yes, absolutely right. Historical data analysis as well. Okay, you can you use the OLAP that is online um, transactions. Okay, that are there. Online analytical processing. OK, so your data warehousing and all those concepts come into this picture. So if I want to do historical analysis, real time analysis of uh, analytics or ELT, if I want to do, I can do using the analytical workloads. OK, so we will be looking at all these uh, services in Azure. OK. Now. Just a few questions, guys, simple questions that are there. So can you all just tell me quickly in the chat box, what is the answer for the first one? Okay, what about the rest? I can see only one person answering. Guys, uh, yeah, absolutely right. First is A, second is B, and third is B. I think mostly said C, but data warehousing is a relational data, guys. It is something that you can work, you can write SQL on it, okay? Uh, you can create reports on it as well, okay? So it is a kind of a relational database itself. It's not a storage, it is a database, but a database. Uh, if I have to now, I, I have to give an example. So a database cannot consist of historical data, but whereas a data warehouse can consist of historical data. Like if you want to find out the uh, uh, how much sales one product did, and let's say that product is no longer available in your system. Okay, so from a database, you will remove it. But from a data warehouse, it never goes. Okay? So that is the difference between the two. Okay, In a database, you will never find a historical data. But in a data warehouse, even if it's two years, three years ago data, you will get it in the data warehouse. And data warehouse has become a common, common uh, format in which people nowadays store their data. Okay. So this was lesson one. Now coming to lesson two, where we will be exploring the data rows. Like I said, data is huge in size nowadays and managing this size of data cannot be one person's uh, job. Okay, it's going to be very, very difficult. I said it's kind of a database. It's not like a database. It's like a database, but with additional property, like you can just query databases, but on a data warehouse, I can write complex queries as well as do reporting and analysis. Along with if I want historical data, I can do that. But in a database, I can only write queries. OK. <clears throat> Then we have different roles in uh, data. Okay, some of the examples, some of the roles are here. 
So a database administrator who's responsible for designing, implementation, and maintenance, of course, of the database. Okay, all the needs of a database is managed, whether it's on-premise or on cloud. Okay, it's managed by the database or DBA, we call it. Okay, he or she is responsible for the availability, consistency of the database, maintaining the database, implementing any policies. Okay, who should get what access? Or how should the data be backed up? Okay, what should be the recovery plan in, in case the database, you know, um, is not available for some reason? How can you back up that database or the data on the database is the job of the administrator. Then you have is the data engineer. So a data engineer is the one responsible for managing or doing all the transformations, cleaning, uh, then ingesting data. Okay, like in now just to give you an overview of this uh, in a data uh, warehousing or data perspective. Okay, data is ingested from various sources. Okay, like I said, the sources can be uh, social media, can be IoT devices, can be websites, can be applications on the mobile phones or on the desktop. Okay, so these sources have to be collected at one place. OK. And this data that you get is generally raw. OK, it is not something that is filtered or uh, nobody looks at the schema or anything like that. OK, so it's kind of you can't read it. OK, so in order to make it uh, presentable or to be worked on or to do some analysis on that data, we need to do some cleaning. We need to ingest data from various sources to one place. We need to do some transformations, okay, like uh, whether this column is playing any role in the final output or not, whether this um, uh, whether there are any missing values, whether there are any um, uh, uh, incorrect, whether there is any incorrect data, all these things need to be care, taken care and that is done by the data engineer. That is the job of the data engineer. OK, so he is the one who is responsible for ensuring all these processes are done properly. OK, um, and um, He's the one who is also responsible for the privacy of your data, maintaining security, OK, and managing that data, creating what we call as a pipeline. OK, so what, what I talked about is like a pipeline where you ingest data, you put it into a store. OK, it can be anything. OK, and then doing some uh, uh, transformations, cleaning. OK, and then finally loading it to another source so that you can create reports. You can create uh, do machine learning on top of it. OK, is the job of a data engineer. So this process is called as extract. E stands for extract. Then transform, that means what you are doing is cleaning, transformation, uh, adding columns, removing certain columns, removing missing values, cleaning values. OK, and then finally you are loading it to a test to another destination. OK, so this is called as ETL. The other process is ELT, OK, where you do you uh, first what you do is you extract all the data and then you load it into a place into a destination where you want to load it and then you uh guys e etl and elt are two types of uh, processes pipelines that you can create it's up to you like how you want to use it Okay, whether you want the data to be first transformed and then loaded, or you want to first extract, load it, and then later transform it, it's up to you. These are two process, big data ingestion processes that are done. Okay, so one is ETL, the other is ELT. So some organizations at times, you know, prefer e ELT. 
they just want their data to be first loaded, extracted and loaded at some place and then it should be transformed. OK. Then. These were the diff, sorry, data analysts. OK, so once the data has been clean, transformed, you can't keep it idle. OK, so you need to uh, do work around with it. Like I said, data needs to be analyzed. Needs You need to make meaning, meaningful decisions out of it. OK, and in order to do that, you need an analyst or a data scientist. OK, so these are the ones who are responsible for creating reports, dashboards, uh, making machine learning mod. Sorry, data scientist is responsible for machine making machine learning models, uh, do training a model. OK, and so on and so forth. OK, so this is what is what are the different roles of uh, uh, in data. Now, now let's talk about the services these are the things that you will be basically learning in this training. OK, so um, if I want to work around data stores, like we talked about files and databases, so files, we lo look at so many formats. OK, but I need to store those files, right? So if I want to store it, I can use uh, Azure storage account. If I want to store non-relational data, I can use the Cosmos DB. If I want to store Relational data or structured data, I will go for Azure SQL. So these are the data stores. And then if you want to work around OLAP, OK, analytical workloads, then you have multiple tools that are available in Azure. OK, you have Data Factory. If you want to do ETL processes, you have Synapse for data warehousing. Databricks, if you want to perform any Spark related big data processing, if you want to do so, Snowflake, somebody mentioned, it's kind of like Databricks. OK, then another big uh, uh, data tool is Azure HD Insight. So if you want to work with Hadoop, you want to work with Spark, you want to work with um, uh, uh, Hive, you want to work with Scoop, you want to work with Take all those uh, big data processing tools are available in HD Insight. OK, all those clusters are available. And then if you want to work with real time data, OK, you have something called as Azure Stream Analytics. You have Data Explorer. So Data Explorer uses another concept. It's like a database, but that database is not a SQL database or something like that. It's for real time data. We will be exploring that. OK, and then if you want to work around protecting your data, uh, keeping your data secure, you go for Microsoft Purview. OK, and then finally, if you want to be a data analyst, OK, you want to uh, visualize your tools, uh, your data, make insight. Um, you want to make insightful decisions or something in you want to see data visualized and I'm pretty sure data if visualized, you can make great decisions. So in order to do that, you have Microsoft Power BI. OK, uh, Microsoft Fabric is a a SaaS tool that has been launched recently by Microsoft. OK, so it combines all these capabilities onto a SaaS foundation. It has a SaaS foundation and it's still in public preview. OK, it's a great tool to use, but if you have to use that tool, you need to know all these services before. OK, so uh, it's a different topic altogether that is there, Microsoft Fabric. OK, so guys, quickly let me know what are the answers for this. What, which one of the following takes responsibility of a database manage? The, who is the what is the responsibility of the database administrator? Yes, then for the second. So if I have to you, who is responsible for the ETL? Yes, absolutely right. And then third. The answer for the last one with single service. Yeah, so Synapse guys is something that uses Spark as well. Spark engine. 
OK, um, I will tell you all what is part little bit in detail once we get to that module. OK, so Synapse, uh, Databricks, these are the two services that use Spark. OK, so with this, we bring an end to module one. OK, it's 1136, 11, 20, around 1140, let's say. So we are going to take a 20 minute break. OK. Uh, a small coffee break and we will resume our session at 12 o'clock.
Hi guys, Chaitali here. Uh, I hope you are finding this webinar interesting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a DP 900 learning achievement batch, which we are providing to all the participants. So basically, this is the complementary learning achievement batch, which includes study material, modules and journey path for DP 900 certification. So you have to follow certain steps to get this batch activated. As you can see on the screen, first you have to go on Microsoft Learn to create an account. If you don't have an account on Microsoft Learn, you have to sign in to create an account. Once you create an account, you will get a URL with the steps. As I have mentioned the steps in the chat box, you will find a URL with it. You just have to click on that URL to get the batch activated. As soon as you uh, click on the redeem button, you will get the batch reflected in your learn profile. Under achievements. As you can see over here. My badge has been activated and I can see my badge under achievements in module and courses. So make sure you follow the steps and get your badge activated. And if you face any problem while redemption of the badge, please do let me know in the chat box so I can help you out with the same.
I hope guys you all are uh, able to get the batch activated. If you are facing any problem, please do mention in the chat box so I can help you out. Guys, the batch will reflect under the achievements as you can see on the screen. I have shared the screen where I can see my batch like DP 900 Microsoft Azure Data Fundamental and the completion date has been mentioned. So you will get the batch under achievements.
Hello. Hello. Is everyone back? Please put a yes in the chat box. Okay, great. So I can see most of y'all have joined. Now let's move to module two. Okay, so in module one, we just saw a brief introduction of data and um, how data is stored in the form of files, databases, uh, what are the different types of files, what are the different types of databases, and then we saw different roles and their responsibilities. Okay, and finally, we saw the different services that Azure gives us okay in order to work with files in order to work with databases now we are going to go a little uh, step further and we are going to explore those services in depth okay uh, for databases what kind of services you have available uh, on azure okay what kind of services you have available for files what kind of services available for non relational databases analytical services that are there on cloud okay so this module is again divided into two lessons first is of course we'll be exploring some fundamental concepts i'm pretty sure you all know about it uh, other relational data concepts okay and then we will be looking at the services related to these relational data okay so let's move to the first lesson the very first lesson is about the relational concepts okay so related to relational databases and i'm pretty sure we have all discussed this okay so a relational table is a, a table where you store data in the form of uh, columns and rows and they are interlinked they have a relation between them Okay, and it is mainly used for structured data. Okay, so for example, you want to store customer table. So you have the customer name, customer ID. Okay, uh, then you have his address, what product he has bought. Okay, product ID probably from which store he has bought, store ID and so and so forth. Okay, so if you want to store the product information, you will create a separate table for that. And to do that, you will have the product ID. You will have uh, the product description, like the product name, what is the cost of the product, okay, and so on and so forth. So this is what is the relational table concept, right? So you have all the rows, you have all rows and have same columns, okay, and each column, we all know has a schema or a data type associated to it okay because we are talking about structured data okay so there has to be a schema defined okay and in order to describe uh, like um if i have to query these tables i will use a sql language that is structured query language where we question the database we query the database okay i want this information I want uh, information from like I want just the first rows. I want information about a specific, let's say, employee, customer, student. OK, so we kind of query those databases. But before we query the database, the data has to be, you know. Where uh, it does not have any replication. OK. Uh, where data does not is not duplicated let's put it in this way okay it has to be something that we call as normalized okay and we need to do normalization and are you aware of the other normalization forms what are the different types of normalization yes guys <laughs> Great. So you have the one, you have one NF, you have two NF, you have three NF, you have BCNF, right? What are those? Those are nothing but the types of normalization. 
Okay, so you need to normalize a data so that data professionals can use it, you know, design schemas um, so that you can minimize uh, duplication. Yeah, that's a huge topic. We will not be covering that. I'm just giving an overview of that of these topics. OK, and we um, I'm not going to focus. My area is not uh, going to we are not going to work on that. Certainly, we don't have that much time. OK, and then of course you need uh, you need to avoid the anomalies that can occur. Like if I store all the information on one table, so you are going to get lots of anomalies or lots of errors like insertion. Where do I insert? Like if I have to insert the customer information. OK, so certain product information will remain. You know, it will not be it will remain blank. There will be uh, lots of null values in that in one table. OK, then I can't delete certain values. There will be a delete anomaly. And of course, I can't um, update. OK, even that will give me a uh, error. OK, so it's always a, a, a best practice to have a normalized data. OK, and uh, so that you can enforce integrity. OK, data integrity is maintained. OK, there is a link. Yes, of course, granularity. Then uh, duplication is not a problem. And if I want to insert, update, uh, remove, I can easily do that. OK, so that is why we require norm normalization. OK. So. You, I will sh I will share the links if you want. We will not be going in depth. OK, so of course you will need a primary key. You will need a foreign key in order to do normalization. And I've been told been telling you all of uh, in order to do this, we need uh, you need to know the concept of uh, databases. OK, like primary key, foreign key. OK. Then in order to query the structured uh, in order to query structured data or the database, we use a language of structured query language. So query meaning you question the database. OK, you need to write commands in order to access data from the database, and that is done through the SQL. OK, so SQL is divided into many such commands. We have the D DDL commands where you uh, which is called as data definition language where you describe the schema of the table. OK, whether you want to what. Of the table, OK. You use uh, SQL, uh, you use the. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm facing network problems. Sorry, I couldn't see the notes. Uh, I cannot see the notes chatting. Uh, Hello, am I audible now? Hello. OK, I'll share my screen again. Is my screen visible? OK, great. Yeah, so we were. Talking about SQL, yes, so if I have to describe the schema of the table, OK, I can use DDL commands where I can use create, alter, OK, delete all these commands, OK, in order to describe the schema or give a definition to the table. OK. 
drop, sorry, not delete, delete will come in DML. Okay. Then we have is the DQL. Okay, it's not mentioned over here, but we have something called as DQL. Which is the direct query, sorry, uh, data query language. Data query meaning your classic select statement. Okay, we need the select statement. What you want to select, which attributes you want to select in order to mention that you use the select query. And SQL without select does not work. We all know we need to start with select. So it comes under the data query language. Then we have is the DCL. Okay, where you grant uh, DML uh, is basically, I'll come to that. Okay, uh, then the DCL, that is the data control language, which tells you about the acts where you have to manage, you know, accessing of the database. Okay, who to grant, who to deny, who to uh, not, you know, what level of um, access you want to give that person or how much permissions you want to give whether uh, let's say that employee is no longer a part of your organization okay so you want to revoke all his access so in order to do that you use the dcl commands okay and then you have the dml commands so what values you want to insert inside the uh, table is determined by the uh, DML commands. Okay. Uh, there is actually no difference between DML and DQL. DQL is just another game, name given to the select command. Okay. But it can be, uh, it is kind of a part of the DML. Okay. So if you want to insert, you want to, uh, yes, correct. DQL is just the select statement. Okay. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, insert your data, you know, insert values to your table, okay, uh, into any like employee table, product table, customer table, you use the DML commands, okay. So, this is the structured query language, and SQL is more like a de declarative language, okay. Uh, DCL is transactional related commands. Okay, all the transactions that you do, if you want to commit and save point and all of those commands come under the TCL command. Okay, so all the transactional related properties, the asset properties, you work around the TCL. Okay, so this is what is SQL. Then more to SQL, we have some more objects in that. Okay. Uh, the very first is the yeah views stored procedures indexes so views are more like i can call it like a virtualized view of your table okay let's say you just don't want to see all the attributes of the tables okay you um you can just create a virtual table okay um then so that can be done using the select statement. You just have to mention select and the view and then the name. Okay. It's like an abstract of your table. Okay. So you can create a view uh, of from multiple tables. Okay. And pull, uh, visualize it as one. Okay. Then you have is a stored procedure. So like I said, uh, SQL is more like a declarative language. Um, and um, we, uh, if I have to, uh, so it just tells me what to do. Like when I say select command, okay, I am just telling it what to do. Like, okay, select star from employee, okay, or select star from customer, select this table, select that table. So I'm telling it what to do, right? Um, it's not like a programming language. It's more like a query oriented language where you write only commands okay so in programming programming is more like a, a descriptive or you know more uh, yeah procedural in nature okay where you um, uh, you write about you create functions you create loops okay in a programming language but in sql i can't do that okay if i want to enable that uh, 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 what we call um, 
if i want to make it like a programming language uh, a sql language i need to use either pl sql for oracle or t sql in uh, sql server yeah so uh, we can do uh, all the uh, procedural stuff create functions write loops uh, use if else give conditions create create stored procedures okay they all fall under that category Okay, so we are not going to go in depth of that. Okay, uh, I'm just telling you all what you can work around with in uh, SQL language. Okay, then you have indexes. So which row the data is, you know, it's like a pointer at which record is your data, uh, uh, you know, is where your select query will start from. Okay. Uh, OK, it is indicating to the specific row at column. OK, so that you can uh, access the entire table row by logo sequential. OK, so these are data. These are types of the database objects of the database. OK. Which enables you to build a more give you more information on uh, the database. OK, you can create parameter i mean you can create stored procedures they are like saved in the memory you can use it again and again indexes you can work which you don't want to start with the first row you want to start with some other row okay you can clearly do that you want to create views you want to do joins you want to do, uh, write sub queries all those things come under this so we are not going to go in depth okay just how relational objects work is what we I have just mentioned over here. You will have to study in depth. You will have to have a prior knowledge of SQL language. OK, so just a quick uh, knowledge check, guys. Just if you can put the answers in the chat box. Yes, the answer for first is B, which of one of the following statements is a characteristic of a relational database. Of course, it's going to be rows, tables, correct, that represent a database. Which SQL statement is used to query tables and return data? Yes, the answer. Oh, OK, is select. Absolutely right. And then what is an index? It's something that will tell you a structure that enables, of course, points at that particular value inside the table helps you locate your data in the table quickly. You can modify that it's up to you. You'll have to know how to do it. OK, so this is what is the relational data. Now in lesson two, we are going to look at the services that are involved in uh, working with this relational data. OK, so the classic service or the generic term that Azure has used is Azure SQL. OK, so if you want to work. So if you want to work with uh, SQL on the cloud, OK, and all of you all know what is cloud, right? So if I want to work with it, I will I can use the Azure SQL. So Azure SQL, like I said, is a generic term. It has three different uh, services. The very first is the SQL Server. Uh, SQL Server on uh, Azure VM. So this particular service is more like uh, IAS. Like if you want to create a SQL Server on uh, a virtual machine. OK, so like I mentioned earlier, IAS is something where you have the flexibility of managing the uh, infrastructure operating system what you want virtual machine uh, the image of the operating system okay it can be customized you can use the pre-existing images as well okay it's all up to you okay you get the flexibility so if i want to install a database on that virtual machine see if i want to install sql server i can do that so i have a uh, 
service available that is called a SQL server on Azure VM. Then we have Azure SQL managed instance. So if you let's say have a SQL instance already created on on premise or your private cloud and you want to do migration. OK, uh, you can use this particular service. So it comes in the form of a pass. OK, you just have to do some basic configurations. OK, and automatically you your database from the on premise premise environment gets um, migrated on the Azure cloud environment. OK, so it's more like managed instance is more like a pass service oriented. Then finally we have is the Azure SQL database. SQL database is the exact same thing of Microsoft SQL Server, the SSMS software. I don't know if you all have heard of it, but it's the exact same thing that works on cloud. OK, so you can use that if you want to create a SQL Server on cloud. This is a service that you will be using. OK, then apart from that, we have other third party open sources softwares also available like uh, like when you you know install a database on your local machine there are lots of challenges that you one might need to face right you whether you have that much space or not whether you have the uh, whether it's an office laptop right so you whether you have the permissions or not cheapest they are all open source you it's all free so nothing or as such cheap on if you're talking in terms of Azure, then the third party softwares are expensive. OK, uh, they cost a lot. The servers cost a lot. OK, so these services that you see that I've mentioned over here, OK, are available. We have a like Microsoft has a tie up with MySQL, MariaDB and PostgreSQL. OK, so that you can use them, configure them according to your needs. OK. And start implementing your uh, uh, start implementing whatever you want to do. OK, just uh, in terms of cost, database costs a lot. I will be talking about I will be showing you an example of that, how it is created. OK, but uh, compared to SQL Server and these third party softwares, SQL Server is much relatively cheaper compared to all of them. OK. So you can create open source software, but otherwise, if you want to install it on your local system, OK, and if you it's your own personal laptop, then it's free. Then you don't have to worry about just worry about the configuration. OK, so now what we are going to do is we are going to see how to create a database on Azure. OK, I already have my Azure portal open. So I will just briefly even show you all or give you a tour of the Azure portal. So this is how your Azure portal looks like. OK, um, this is the mark. This is where you can search for any uh, applic any resource that you want. OK, virtual machine, storage account, databases. OK, so now I'm going to go for the SQL databases that are there. OK, so I get. Sorry, I just don't oh, I want to show you all this. Okay, I'm just going to come home. I'm going to search for Azure SQL. OK, so if I come over here. Why isn't it giving me? Uh, OK, it's not giving me options. Yeah, this is it. So you can see the different the three services that Azure SQL offers that I talked about. So if you want to create a SQL, uh, you want to install SQL Server on a virtual machine, you can create select the image that you want. You can see there are a list of images that are there. OK, SQL Server with C latest SQL Server you want, you can do that. So or if you want to install Postgre, MariaDB, MySQL on a virtual machine, that too is possible. Just you need to do uh, like how you install it on your local machine. You will be doing it on a virtual machine. OK, but you will not be charged for the uh, third party software just for the virtual machine. You will be charged. 
Okay, then you have managed instances. So if you want to do a lift and shift, that is migration options. If you want, you go for the SQL instance. So if if it's one database or you have multiple databases, it's from an uh, Azure Arc. Okay, you can uh, select this service. And now if you want to create a SQL database that is SSMS on cloud, this is the service plan that you will go for. And I'm going to go for this plan. OK. So I have come into my environment. I'm going to create a new resource group. OK, like you all know, uh, we uh, we need uh, a resource group for every service that we every resource that we create. OK, so I'm going to give a resource, create a resource group and I'm going to call it webinar. So whatever services guys I create for today, I'm going to store it in my I'm going to store it in this uh, resource group. So in the end, I will be able to delete the entire resource group and I will no longer need it. OK. Now I'm going to create a database. I'm going to give my database a name. So I'm just going to say D database. OK, and uh, check. Uh, for the uh, whether it's uh, unique or not, okay. Check whether it is validated or not. You should get a tick mark over here. And now uh, we are going to create a server, okay. Like you all know, uh, a database is deployed on a server, so we will need a server of our own, okay. So I'm going to create on new because I don't have a server created, and I'm going to give it a name. Check whether it is valid or not. OK, so I always prefer to give some number. Let's see if it's taking like today's date is 14th. OK, it's not taking that. Probably this it's you can give any numbers. OK, it's not even using that. So you guys will have to do some trial and errors. OK, and region I'm going to keep East US because it's going to give me the cheapest option. I'm going to go for SQL authentication. I'm going to create a SQL user. Some unique name and then give a password of your own. OK, now click on OK. And now I'm going to go for yeah, I'm going to go for development. I'm going to go for cheaper options, guys, so that I can save a lot of money. So this all you will need to study. This is another entire, uh, you know, uh, what we uh, another day or two just to explain what all of the, these CPUs, DTUs are. OK, and I'm going to go for locally redundant. This I will be talking about when we do storage accounts, so you will understand that this concept over there. Then I'm going to come to networking and uh, I'm going to go for a public endpoint. So guys, by default, uh, there is a firewall that is applied on a database in uh, uh, specifically to a, a, a SQL database on Azure. OK, so we need to give our IP address. We need to allow our IP address to access the database. OK, so in order to do that, I'm going to give it an access so that any other resource or service wants to access. They can do it from any other server. OK, and whatever is my current IP address as well. OK, I will also give that an access. OK. And then I will come to additional settings and in additional settings we will need a data. We will need a database, right? So I'm going to go with sample and here you can see it is saying that it will use a sample database of adventure works. So adventure works you all know is a, a, a database created by Microsoft. So it's going to use that as the sample database. OK. Now I'm going to click on review plus create. It's going to validate whether I can whether I can use or create a database in that specified region or not. OK, and it'll give you an idea of cost and everything, how much it will be charged. OK. And I'm going to click on create. So it's a big resource. It's going to take time to create.
Really there. Okay, it has already created all these things. Server has also been created. Just database is being created. That's what it is doing. Yes, and you can of course uh, uh, upload your own data. Okay, uh, definitely you can do that. You can uh, create your own database on it. Okay, whatever data you want, you can. Um, Uh, yes, this includes the cost of VM SQL Server. Okay, all the uh, it includes. Okay. Yeah, the resource has been created. So let's go to the resource. So this is the overview. OK, this is all the information that you will get. OK, so now I'm going to go to the query editor where I can query my data, enter it the, into the database. OK, so you can see my server name and my database name has come. OK, so I'm going to enter the password that I had given. And I'm going to click on OK. What did that add? If it gives you error like this, so just add the firewall. OK, so for that, you need to come to the overview tab and add it. Okay. Over here, set firewall. OK, so now if I go here, it should give me any access. Yeah, so it did. So guys, if you face any error, OK, while logging in, I told you there's a firewall that is there. So just add your IP address. You can give custom IP addresses also. OK, whatever you have in your virtual network. OK, you can definitely do that and they can get access. That is totally fine. OK, so here you can see all the tables have come. OK, uh, you can. Uh, query these tables. So this is where you can write the queries. So if I say select. Keep it capital. Select star from. Okay, a simple query. I'm just running. I'm just going to say sales product. Okay, and I'll just give it a semicolon. Select it. Okay, and then run it. So you here you can see it is taking some time. Okay, to query. So you can see your output over here. Okay, the columns in the product table, all that information comes below. So this is exactly like how your SQL server works. Okay, so if I want to access it through my SQL server, I can do that as well. Okay, so I'll just show you how to do it. So if you have SQL Server installed, uh, I'll share a link for that. I will not be spending time on uh, showing you all how to do that because we don't have much time. OK, so I will def I'll share a link. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, you can even I'll even tell you all how to uh, add your own data so you all can just refer to it. OK. Yeah, so I've opened my SQL Server. OK, over here, I'm just going to give a SQL Server authentication. OK, and I'm going to. Give my server name, which is uh, just a minute. Yeah, sorry, there was a mistake. Yeah, so if I come to over here. 
Oh, just say okay. So you can see there is a SQL. So this is the name. So I'm just going to copy this. Okay, come to my SQL server. Okay, and given my credentials. And give your password that you had created. And just click on connect. Just a minute. Why is it giving me a error? Come on. Oh, the name. Yeah. So I can access the database even on my SQL server. So it's getting connected. OK, so all the databases, the AdventureWorks database is going to come in over here. So if you view tables. So here also you can come and upload your own data. OK, uh, that is also one way of doing. If you have SQL server, Oracle, whatever, you can do that. OK. So you can see all the tables have come and then you can start querying it. So if I say new query. I say select. From. Dot LT. Sorry, LT dot. You will have to write link, okay. Sorry guys, I think network problem and all is just making it slow. Yeah, so I'll just get back to this. Yeah, OK, so this is how you can work around using the SSMS. Software as well, you can work online also on cloud as well. 
okay it works absolutely fine okay so this is how you create a simple uh, database okay and i even showed you all how to connect to the uh, sql server okay or if you have a software installed okay Yes, so this is more or less about the database as a service in Azure. OK, you can create uh, any of these instances. It's up to you. OK, guys, we're not going to go in much depth of what is DML, all the SQL language. I'm not going to sit and teach all that. OK, uh, it's something that is a prerequisite OK, that you know. OK, so that's what we did in this entire module too. Okay, it's just more or less like an overview of the uh, topic. Okay, so you can connect to your database if you have SSMS installed and all of that. Okay, so just quickly let's do a knowledge check, like all how we have been doing. Okay. So just quickly answer, guys, in the chat box. Yeah, so guys, the concept of elastic pool and single database, like elastic pool is like a pool of databases that you have. Okay, so if you need more databases, you can just uh, get it from the pool. Okay, and um, use it if your load increases on one database, like scalability, if you're looking for, you can just take a, a, a database from the pool and use it. Okay, then yeah, that's the only concept that is there. OK. Yeah, so you guys are absolutely right. Yeah, the first answer is managed instance because it is something that will help you for the lift and ship, shift migration operations. OK. So with this, we bring an end to module two. That's it in module two. So it has the least percentage. Uh, that I showed you. Okay, uh, it is only about fifteen to twenty percent, but still it's important. Okay, and uh, in the end we will be looking at um, uh, in the end we'll be looking at. Uh, yeah, I will just talk about like uh, uh, I can't understand your question. Like, why not manage instance for this? So, if you have to manage uh, LAMP uh, application, like it's mentioned over here, okay, you can use uh, MySQL, and it is used for those operations. Like, if you have a Linux or you're using Apache, okay, connecting to a Linux machine using MySQL is much more easier than any of these two. OK, so that is why or you want to work with PHP. Any of these domains you're working and you need a database, then MySQL is um, and why there is no managed instance. I have no idea about it, but uh, there is a direct. I'll even show you. Um, There are like in you can go and create uh you go on home you can look for a database sorry yeah databases or something like that so for MySQL servers and all you can create one 
okay this is how you simply all you need to know is about a flexible server okay this is a concept that you need to go in depth like i told you okay so there is no managed instance for this but yeah it's more or less managed instance only it's like a pass service that is there so yeah i actually didn't understand your question like if you can elaborate Okay, so you will have to go. Actually, it's more like this is I'm not going to cover in depth over here. It's more or like more or less like an overview. Okay, which um, if you have to go in depth of databases, there are you can. Okay, uh, but just this is the overview. So I think it's almost 1250. So do you want me to start with module three or like we'll take a lunch break? What, do, what is your opinion, guys? I'll do whatever you want. Like, okay. So we'll do one thing, we'll do just 10 minutes or whatever, 10, 15 minutes of some part of module or three. Okay. Uh, and then we will. Um, yes, guys, just uh, if you are working with a database. Okay. Um, just keep in mind that. Um, like on a date when you create a database, there is a server and a database that is created. OK, and if you're working in free trial or something, it is always advisable that you delete the server. OK, delete this instance as um, early as possible. Create it again. If you want, it will just be a practice. OK, but this is the server cost a lot. It will exhaust your subscription. OK, so make sure you delete the server. It is very important, OK, because I remember like I had created a server and I forgot to delete it, exhausted my entire pass in like a week's time. OK, it, it is that uh, cost. Ex it really uses your cost. OK, so be very judicious when you're working with a database or creating a pool of databases. OK, it's not that it is uh, it comes for free. It is really, really uh, uh, cost intensive. You need to invest a lot when you work with a database. OK, so keep this point in mind. OK, whenever you are creating database, there is no cost as such involved you saw it was like uh, around 300 rupees but the server cost is high so it is advisable to delete the server you can delete the database as in when you want okay now the basic cost and unit i'll show you all the costings okay it's up to you all what you select okay uh it's Cost depends on what you select, like the disk and the CPUs or your configuration. OK, whether it's for development or for production. OK, these are the factors that matter. You can add, you know, you can still configure and change and reduce the cost. OK, so in the end, I'll just show you all how to do manage your cost. OK, how you can predict the cost. So for now, let's start with. Um, yeah, there, can, there are free tier, not free tier, basic tiers actually not free. Database is actually not free. Uh, you need to select some basic or standard tiers. Okay, like I said, you can manage that cost. Okay, you can predict what the uh, how much the cost it's going to cost you. Okay, so I will show that in the end. Okay, to you all. So now let's get started with module three. So module three, uh, if module two talked about the databases, module three is going to talk about the files. 
the non relational database so how you can store your files how you can um, which types all the types of files that we talked about you can store what are the different ways of storing so in order to do that you need a storage account so that's what we are going to explore in this and then we are going to see a couple of um, azure uh, non relational databases okay so the very first thing is a storage account. So a storage account, as the name says, it's a service. Okay, it's a fast service, and it is um a, a where you store your uh, data. Okay, how you store like on your local machine, you store it in the form of folders and files. The same approach almost is taken by the storage account. Okay, so it's like a simple account that you create uh, in uh, Azure. Okay, so if you can't afford to buy a hard disk, some external um, storage service, okay, or like a USB or hard disk or pen drive or whatever, okay, you can store your data online, okay, uh, on a storage account, okay, like all your files and stuff, okay. So storage account is basically may is you know of uh, four types on Azure. OK, um, there is a block storage, you have file storage, you have table storage and you have queue storage. Apart from that, there is this storage also, but we are not going to look at it. It's pertaining to your virtual machine or you have the concept of managed disk and unmanaged disk over there, but uh, it's too much in depth. So we are not going to go much more into that. We are going to uh, look at the four types that I just spoke about. OK, and the most important and the most commonly used is the blob storage. So blob like we saw in module one is binary large object. OK, where you can store any file you want CSV, JSON, uh, your audio, video files, anything you can store it in blob. OK, so a blob is so in order to use a blob, uh, you need to have a storage. Uh, you need to have an account, a storage account. OK, then you need to create a container. So on Azure, a blog is called as a container. OK, and inside that container, you store your blobs, objects. OK, whether it's an image file, it's a text file, it's a CSV file, you can store it over there. OK, so these are the three basic types of resources within the blog. Okay? And you can organize it OK, the way you want it. You want a file folder created, you can do that. OK, and then there are three types of blobs. That is the block blob, the page blob and the append blob. So what is a block blob? It is the blob the, where you store all your images, your uh, all these bind, all these objects, binary large objects are stored in nothing but the block blob. Uh, sorry, we will not be sharing the presentation. OK, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want. OK, um, from there you can definitely re refer to the recording. OK, then we have is the page blob. So page blob is more or less associated to the disk storage that I was talking about. OK, um, and guys, I will be telling you all about these from where you can refer to these to this material. I have taken it from the Microsoft official site. I will be sharing all the details. Just keep a little patience. OK, I am going to help you with it. We are going to be discussing about the exam prep also. I'm going to be giving you an overview of that as well, where you can schedule your exam and how you can prepare for the exam practice test, uh, how you can start your uh, as your free trial. All that I'm going to discuss towards the end. OK, so my primary focus right now is to cover the modules. OK, give you an overview of DP900. OK, so coming back, uh, page blobs is mainly associated to the disk storage that I was talking about. OK, you can upload your customized uh, .vhd files OK, that you want to use for your VMs. OK, it's uh, this is where you store it. OK, so the size is very large, right? You are going to store an image file so that too for a virtual machine. So the size is going to be very large. So you need a different kind of storage. And then finally, you have append where you can append to your blog blocks. Append meaning add 
anything to the blob. Okay, you can do that through the blob storage. Okay, then there are so uh, yeah. Now coming to so a blob blob you can see it can store up to four point seven TBs. It is mentioned over here. Okay. And up to like 100 MBs of so blocks can come can consist of 100 MBs. Okay, so that way it can make 4.7 TBs altogether. Okay, so there are blocks made, and in that blocks you can have around 100 MBs of data, and together it can make up to 4.7 TB. Okay, so before we get into uh, uh, more details of uh, block storage, uh, I want to tackle a concept called as redundancy, which we saw even in the database. Okay, so redundancy basically means um, backing up of your data or replicating your data. Okay, so so that okay, when whenever you uh, there is some. Um, that some for some reason, okay, your yeah, any reason for natural calamity or uh, power failure or for any any reason your uh, data is lost, it can be recovered so that your data is highly available and durable. Okay, so I don't need to. I hope I don't need to take, tell you what is high availability. Okay, yes, it will cost a lot. That's for sure. Okay, so in that situation, uh, we need to make our data redundant. We need to back up our data. And in order to do that, we have various uh, ways. The first way is the locally redundant storage. Okay, so what is a locally redundant storage? Uh, do you all know what are availability zones? Basically, can you all just quickly tell me what are availability zones? Since you all know what are regions and all of that, so you, I'm pretty sure you all know what is a availability zone. Yes, guys. No, availability zones, okay. Um, Okay, so we all know the concept of. Okay, I'll just uh, open paint and I'll explain this concept. Sorry, guys, I am facing some netto of you. Just a minute, give me a minute. I can, but you will not be able to understand it verbally. It's better if I show you all visuals, it will make it very much clear for you all. Is my screen visible? Okay, so uh, when you, uh, we, like I said, you need to select a region in Azure. Okay, so a region uh, is divided okay, into something called as availability zones. So every region has three availability zones. So what is an availability zone? It is, let's say, more or less like a data center.
it is more or less like a data center so in a date so availability zone can have either one data center or they can have two data centers it is up to microsoft to decide or the cloud service provider okay so this is let's say az1 this is az2 availability zone 2 and let's say this is availability zone 3 okay so like i said every availability zone is more or less like a data center and they are connected through low latency optical fibers Why low latency? Because when you are transferring data or working around between availability zones, backing up your, your data, so these the availability zones or data centers should not be responsible for, you know, causing that delay, okay, causing that uh, factor of uh, uh, late, uh, providing you with latency so that your high availability, that is HA, is low. Okay, so they should not be responsible. So your cloud service provider is should not be responsible in order to, uh, you know, add to that delay. So that is why they are low latency optical fibers. Okay, so now when I say when I use call as locally redundant storage. So what does this do? It takes it makes actually three synchronous copies of your data. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay, so let's say I have created a storage account. Okay. And on that storage account, I uh, have my uh, data stored. Okay, so let's say it has stored in the first availability zone. Okay. And we all know that availability zone is basically made up of data centers and a data center like looks like, you know, like a big building full of servers. OK, and we have something called as racks of servers. So how we have a building full of floors. Similarly, we have we have a data center which has multiple racks. OK, so this is how it looks like in one. This is how it looks like, you know, data center. And this is what is a part of the availability zone. OK, so when I create, when I say locally redundant, OK. When I say locally redundant, OK, and I have created a storage account. Let's say that storage or that data, just one minute. That data has been created on the first track, okay, of my availability zone one, okay, first of data center one, okay. I'll call this D1. And it has stored on the first track of the data center. So when I make, when I select locally redundant or LRS, what it will do, it will create three, three copies of this data on the same data center. On D1 itself, it will make three copies of my data. Okay, and why synchronous? Why this term synchronous has come? Because the moment, the moment I create this account or store my data at the same time, these three copies will be created for me. OK, at the same time when I am creating this account. So now what is happening? I if this entire rack. OK, this entire rack, let's say goes down. 
for some reason power failure and there's no network in that rack okay the servers have gone down in this rack okay of data center one so now what will happen my i have my data available on this rack on this rack or on this rack for me so what is happening i have not lost my data it is ready and available for me okay so this is what is called as locally redundant storage but now what if i say what or what happens like if this entire zone or the entire database or oh sorry data center goes down again the reasons are the same do you think my data is going to be available for me Do you think your data will be available for you guys? If if the data is if I go if I select if I select LRS, okay, as my redundant uh, storage, okay, to back up my data, okay, and um. Let's say the zone has gone down where my data or that data center has gone down. OK, so do you think the entire data center has gone down? OK, do you think my data will be backed up? No. No, my you're absolutely right. We will not be able to I will not get this data i will not be able to get this available to me or any of these three copies available to me why because the entire zone has gone down so if i want to overcome the problem pertaining to the zone i can use another redundant storage called as the zrs so ZRS makes three copies of your data, okay, uh, on three different or in availability zones synchronously. It will make three synchronous copies of your data in the other two availability zones of your Azure region. So now what it will do? Probably this data that you had, okay? It will create it over here. Probably at this data center, the same thing. Three copies it will make somewhat like that randomly it will make it is up to the cloud service provider okay or or one here one in this data center or probably one in the availability zone over here okay it can mean okay it's up to the cloud service provider but so this is what is called as three sorry zrs so synchronous the same meaning I don't have to explain that again. So the moment you create, you select ZRS, okay, in one, any one of these read, uh, availability zones, it will create your account, and at the same time, it will make that make three copies of your data, okay. So this is what we call it ZRS. So, but what if the entire region goes down? Entire region goes down. What's going to happen? Do you think ZRS will protect me from it? No, right? It's not going to help me at all. So in order to do that, right? And we, so in order to save from this, okay, from this particular failure, from region level failure, Azure has given me another redundant storage called as the G. R S. So 
which is the geo redundant torrent so this is nothing but lrs plus three asynchronous copy of your data okay so it will follow lrs okay but now in order you, we all know that azure region okay there is a primary region okay and then there is a secondary region okay so every region in azure like how we selected east us there is a uh, region pair associated to it okay so if i have selected east us as my primary region okay what it will do it will have another probably east us to west us as the secondary region okay so what will if i go for grs what will my cloud service provider do he'll do the same thing okay he'll follow lrs okay like we know every region has three availability zones okay he will or create there will be availability zones and then on these second region okay that is the secondary region he will follow the lrs redundant storage so that is what is called as grs okay what if this availability zone or let's say it's on availability zone 1 Okay, what if this crashes for some reason? Okay. What if this happens? So then what it will do? It will go for GZRS, which is nothing but ZRS plus 3A synchronous copies of your data so guys asynchronous meaning not at the same time okay if synchronous means when you create your account and uh, at the same time it will be backed up so asynchronous is obviously going to be the opposite okay and it is going to um not at the same time when you create a data uh, storage it is not going to be backed up at the same time it is going to uh, you know after probably an hour or so it will back up your data onto the other region okay but of course this comes with a heavy price okay you are going to have to use uh, you will have to give a lot of um, you will have to invest a lot of money in order to use grs uh, zones of uh, redundant storage okay it's uh, going to be very cost intensive of course you're going to get high availability and durability is going to be around what um uh, if you go for grs it will be around 16.11 or uh, or if you go for gzrs or ga uh, or ra GR, grs or something like that you're going to get around 16 point uh sorry 99 point uh 12 nines followed by it Okay, so that's the durability and the high availability it gives you. But of course, like I said, it's going to be very, very cost in intensive. Okay, and if you're working at a very low level, don't go for uh, or don't go for GZRS or GRS. Go for LRS if your data is not that important. But if you are working with a critical data like army data and all of that. Okay, you should go for GRS because you will be investing that much into uh, protecting or backing up of your data. Okay, so this is the redundancies that are there in an uh, Azure uh, storage account. Then now let's look at the access tiers. Okay, so you know there are different levels at which you can access your data in a block storage. 
Okay, and there are four types of access tiers. One is the hot access tier. That means your data you access frequently. Okay, like it's something like uh, medical data or transactional data. Just giving you example, which is accessed frequently. Right, so you need to keep it in a month. You need to store it in that form. Okay, so that form is the hot tier. OK, yeah. and you can modify it. You are modifying it frequently and so on and so forth. OK, but of course, this is going to have the highest cost. OK, access cost. It's going to cost you a lot. OK, because you're accessing it frequently. Then you have is the pool tier. So let's say you are not accessing that data frequently in like, let's say uh, one, one no, eight, 30 days. OK, you are accessing that data. OK, uh, within 30 days, like you want to see what was the last month sales data, what was the mark, what was the traffic generated on your website, not on daily basis. It's not something that is critical, right? So you want to access it probably after a month, OK, or within like 20 days, 25 days. OK, you can store it in the form of a pool access tier. OK, then uh, Microsoft has recently launched this tier earlier it was not there it is uh, come up really recently it's called a cold tier okay so let's say you don't want to act so because after you you have the uh, earlier the, uh, there was cool tier and then there was archive tier so archive you you couldn't access the data like uh, for a quite a long time six months for 180 days you couldn't access that data like and of course, if you are rarely accessing that data, you will store it in the archive tier. OK, but there was no middle ground between the two. OK. So if you want to access it in, in a week or so, please go for um, I would say go for cool tier. OK, the process of accessing the data from a cool tier is much better compared to a cold tier. OK. But there are some places where people don't want to access that data on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. They want to take it time, probably three months and so on and so forth. So that is why for those reasons, a cold tier has also been introduced by Microsoft. OK, so it, it is all dependent on uh, how frequently you access your data. Less frequent, like you know, all stages Microsoft has covered for you. OK, it's all up to you whether you want to access how you want to access it. OK, certainly the, uh, the cost varies. OK, the cost for each tier is going to vary. OK, the more you invest, uh, you can get the data as fast as possible. You can access the data as fast as possible. But if you let in, the, if you put in less cost, of course, it's going to give you time to access. It's not going to give you uh, that easily accessibility okay so that's the this that's the, the that's the only um challenge that is there then of course finally like i talked about is the archive tier archive tier you don't want to access data for probably you know six months or uh, let's say okay you can go for the archive tier it is the most uh flexible i mean it is uh the least uh, uh i mean the least cost is involved in creating an access uh, archive access tier. But if you have to access this data, if you have put it into archive tier, uh, then you will have to, you know, um, uh, wait for a long time, one hour, two hour, for in order to access that data because it's going to take a lot of time. It's it's not being touched, no. So it's of course going to take time to. It's not going to be easily accessible to you. OK, so that's the only disadvantage I feel that's there in archive tier. OK, so if you've stored anything into archive tier, you can make it into a cool tier. You can make it into a hot tier. It is up to you. OK, that process is called as rehydration. OK, so something that you convert from archive tier to a, a, a whole hot, cool, cold access tier is called as rehydration. So this was about access tiers. OK, so this was in general about uh, block storage. OK, so block storage uses a concept called as flat on uh, flat namespace. OK, so uh, it does not have a hierarchical approach. If you want a hierarchical approach, you need to use the data lake store Gen 2. 
okay uh, there was a generation one which i'm not going to talk about it's not needed so we'll talk about the latest service that microsoft is giving you okay so uh, we um can use uh, the only difference between a block storage and data lake is the hierarchical format okay if block storage uses flat namespace uh, data lake uses the hierarchical namespace so I'm pretty sure everyone stores data on their local machine. So, you know, you create folders and inside that you keep on, you keep files, right? You uh, exact, yeah, like folder parts. So there is a hierarchy that is created. Okay. So if I have to create that same hierarchy on the cloud, okay. Block storage does not allow me to do that. Okay. I will show you all how, why it is like that. Okay. Um. So if I have to, uh, uh, want that hierarchy, I will go for the data lake. So, so uh, let's quickly create a block storage and a data lake store and understand the difference uh, between the two. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go back to my portal. I'm going to go to storage accounts. Okay, I already have some created, so I'm going to create a new one over here. And I'm going to go for the uh, resource group that I created earlier. Yeah, you have to give a very unique name to your storage. Okay. So I'm just seeing, and it has to be validated. Okay. Go for locally redundant. Okay, and then just click on review. Now click on create. No, we did not do this before we are creating a storage account that the earlier lab was about a uh, database. So I'm just creating a storage account. Okay, so it seems it has created the storage account. So like I said, um, if I have to create a block, I need to have a storage account. So first you need to have this account created and then you can decide what you want to do. Okay, so if you want to create a blob, so you need a container. If you want to do file share, which I will tell you all what it is and queues and tables. Okay, so now I'm going to create a blob storage. So I'm going to go to containers. Here I'm going to create a container, let's say data. Okay, it's up to you. You can select whatever name you want. Just keep it logical. Um, I always go for what for what purpose I'm making this uh, particular storage. Okay, and I try to relate it to the application. Okay, so I'm going to go inside data. It has created. Okay, by default, uh, it is a private data. You can create make it anonymous. That is up to you. Okay. So now here, this is my data. A container here I'm going to upload a simple file okay an image file I'm going to upload so I can so I can browse it so I'm going to browse it from my local machine I'm going to go for an image you can even upload CSV files that is also fine okay yeah. that is also fine I'll just say upload at the moment 
So by default, it will take a hot access here. OK, so if you do, if you want to change the access here, you can change it. So you can see these are the types hot, cool, cold, archive that I talked about. OK, if you want to change, you can definitely change. So just select this change tier. And I'm going to go with cool. OK, just save it. OK, now earlier it was hot. Now it has become cool. OK. So before that, I am going to uh, upload one more this thing. I'm going to go for auto data that I have. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder called as auto. OK, and I'm just going to click on upload. OK, so now you can see I have a folder with uh, my file auto uh, data CSV. OK. So I'm just going to keep this on hold before this. I'm going to create a data lake storage. So I'm going to come home. I'm going to go to storage account. OK, I'm going to create a new storage. So it's the same process. You need a new storage. Just give it some random name, guys. I'm just selecting some random name for the pop at the moment. I'm going to say locally redundant. Now I'm going to come to the advanced options and scroll down. So if you see there is a you have a feature to enable hierarchical namespace. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable this. OK, and now I'm going to click on review. Now let it create a storage account. So storage account does not take much time to be created actually. I doubt it will give you, uh, you know, um, so access to create uh, with the same name. I doubt that, okay, because it's uh, because these names are very unique, and once somebody uses it, it's not no longer available to you. So I would recommend to use different names, okay. And uh, Ganesh, I I don't I don't understand what you mean by performance, like in terms of what? Can you just elaborate on that? OK, so our resource has been created. So now if you come here, so if I go to my storage accounts. So here you see the symbol for the container is different. And if you come to the data lake storage, here you can see the symbol for the container is different. So this symbol indicates that this is a hierarchical namespace. OK, so how hierarchical? Now I'll just show it to you. I'm going to create a container here as well. So you will by default, guys, you will need a container whenever you work with storage account. OK. Let's say data. Now here I'm going to upload the same file. Open. Here also I'm going to create a folder with the same name auto, let's say, and I'm going to say upload. OK, so now if I come to the storage account that I created my blob storage. Now, since this is a flat namespace, what is going to happen even though I have created this folder? 
now let's say i don't no longer need this folder okay i will not be able to delete this folder entirely why because it is a flat name space so whenever you create a folder in a block storage okay the folder is going to be pseudo in nature it's going to be superficial it is going to have no existence at all it's just there like because you have created you want to just store it store you know everything at one place okay so it's just there for pseudo purposes okay but it has no reference to your files inside it is just there so if i want to delete this entire folder i will not be able to delete it instead what i have to do is i have to come inside the folder delete this file okay select the snapshots it's going to create snapshots in the memory so we don't want that okay so you have to uh, select these okay and i if i click on okay now now what will happen if i come to data you can see the file is no longer available to me but in order to do that if i have to delete that entire folder okay you will have to go inside that folder and then delete files inside it so just imagine if that entire folder has 30 to 40 files created and literally i have also when i worked with other services i've actually you know sat and i've deleted 30 to 40 files inside this blob storage and it's not easy okay for every you have to go select each and every file and delete still i showed you all an example of one file but you can have 30 to 40 files created inside and sit and going and individually you know deleting is a headache okay so if you want to avoid that you will have to create you will, you can use a data lake store so now if i come to the data lake store and come to containers i come to data and if i select this file now you can see i can delete the entire folder so this is no longer pseudo folder this has an extent like this is there okay this file exists in that container okay and it has a path to it okay so it will give me an option to delete how you work i'm pretty sure you have worked with the local i mean file system on your machine so it's the same concept over here okay so i'll say delete yes so all the files that were there inside auto have been deleted so this is the difference between the uh, between block storage and data store data lake store okay so like if you want to you know uh, delete uh, files um, individually okay but you want to keep it at one place let's say the files are like you know interlinked okay uh, you use the block storage uh, you don't want the entire uh, uh, you know all the files to be deleted but if you want to um, work with uh, a, you know organize better yeah absolutely right you want to uh, uh, the entire folder is no longer needed okay you can go for the data lake store and nowadays people prefer the data lake store compared to a blob storage okay so that's the only purpose there is no other reason okay in order to use a blob storage and a data lake both are the same just this one difference that is there okay then apart from the uh, blob and the data lake you have the file storage so if you are working with on premises uh, uh, data okay and you want to share files within the organization to your cloud and so and so forth you will go for the file share okay between vms if you want to share files you will go for the azure files okay it uses two protocols that is the smb server message block and the networking file network file system okay it of course involves cost high availability everything just data is of course encrypted again the same concepts are used okay but it is in a nest 
okay like how you have directory you have files inside it but just imagine sharing it across 10 vms across uh, azure and all on your on premise data center okay then you have is the table storage so your classic example is the key value storage your data uh, i mean json format okay uh, you can store data semi structured data over here so every key has a value unique uh, there's a unique key there's a partition between those keys okay and you can use it so uh, of course there's no concept of relationships because it is semi structured okay semi structured data is stored basically over here okay and um, for those purposes you can use the table store and then finally you have the queue storage so let's say how we can queue our messages or emails right so if you want to queue your messages data and probably send it after some time you will go for the queue storage okay so this is mostly about the storage in azure okay let's do a quick knowledge check and then we will stop for break so just quickly answer guys in the chat box So a, a, a table will require a partition key and a row key, okay? Uh, because there are multiple keys, so you need to partition them, okay? So you will require the partition key and the row key. Then uh, what should you do to an existing Azure storage account in order to support? A, of course, you'll need to enable it to a hierarchical namespace, okay? So that that blob storage it becomes like a data lake. OK, so that hierarchy is there. And of course, if you want to share data between on premise and cloud, OK, or between VMs, you will go for the file store. OK, so with this, we uh, have not concluded module three. There's still much left. So now I think it's almost 140. So we are going to uh, take a break. OK, a lunch break. So uh, one hour lunch break we will be uh, taking. So it's let's say 140 and we'll resume at 240. OK, so see you after the break. Sorry, guys, it's 2.40. Chaitali, uh, sorry, it's 2.40. My, my mistake. Just change it. Yeah, sure, sure. 